So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is uh, the final slot before lunch. Um, it is my great pleasure to, to welcome you all, and a big thank you to Specsavers who are, who are sponsoring this session. So, uh, so grip tightly to your seats. You're going to be in for a roller coaster ride over the next 30 minutes. Uh, we've got uh, AQP, adult hearing loss, and, uh, loss, warts and all. Uh, we've got th three very eminent people talking, and we're going to have some, uh, some questions and answers at the end of it. So if I may just kick off. Um, I'm Nav Chan, I'm Vice Chairman of the NAPC, so welcome to you all again to, uh, to, to, to this session. Please make sure your mobile phones and devices are switched to non-distract mode. Um, hands up, that's who's in the audience. Uh, if you're a GP, hands up. If you're, uh, you work in general practice, you're not a GP, nurse, practice manager, involved in commissioning in some capacity. Any other species I haven't mentioned? Okay, good, good, that's good. Um, so, um, so, so thank you very much for, for, for coming along. So I'm going to introduce our speakers. Um, first up, on the, from, from left to right, we have Sarah Jarvis, uh, a GP from Hammersmith, and many of you will recognize, well-known in broadcasting circles, uh, writes, uh, talks, very, you know, all over the place. So you'll see and hear from her, and I think Sarah's on TV tonight, I think. So that's, uh, so have an opportunity to see her in action there. We also have, in between, Colin Campbell, Director of Professional Services from Specsavers Hearing Centre, Centres, um, so he'll give us a bit of a perspective from Specsavers a bit later on, and also Professor Kevin Munro, who is the Ewing Professor of Audiology uh, at the University of Manchester and Consultant Clinical Scientist at Central Manchester Foundation Trust. So, so three very different perspectives. Um, what we're planning to cover in this session is to give you a, a sense about provision of uh, adult hearing loss services and how you can use the AQP procurement model, perhaps explore the sort of learnings, success challenges from doing this to date uh, and any concerns around that AQP procurement route uh, and also how we might think about providing audiology services differently in the future. Does that feel all right? Are you sure? Okay, in which case we're, we're straight off with Professor Kevin Munro, Ewing Professor of Audiology. Over to you, Kevin. So uh, thank you to Specsavers for this uh, opportunity. There's five brief points that I wanted to make in our time together today. And the first point is that we, uh, we live in a communication era. We'd be lost without things like mobile telephones, for example. Uh, but if we can't hear well, we can't communicate at ease, and that has consequences for performance at work. It has consequences for our relaxation and appreciation of things like music and that has knock-on effects for our, our general health and our well-being. So living in a communication era, uh, survival of the fittest, being able to function well in our environment uh, relies on uh, good hearing. Most of the people that come through our, to our clinics will have an age-related hearing loss. So where are we in terms of a cure for age-related hearing loss? Some promising things coming along in terms of uh, stem cell therapy. So it is plausible that there may be a cure, but that's some way off and the prospects are somewhat daunting. In terms of prevention, there is evidence to show uh, the relationship between hearing loss and things like diet and lifestyle and exercise. So we're starting to move from thinking that hearing loss is an inevitable consequence of aging to thinking that it may be modifiable. But we're talking about many years down the road and probably not within your or my lifetime. So we're, we currently consider age-related hearing loss as permanent and the primary treatment is the hearing aid and the associated intervention and support that, that comes along with that. Second point I wanted to make is that hearing loss is uh, it's not particularly sexy and it's not particularly trendy and it doesn't really catch the public's eye. If you ask people who have normal hearing about healthcare concerns, hearing comes uh, well down the list. And it's partly because it, it has a slow onset, it's insidious, and although it's permanent, we don't think it's going to kill us. So it doesn't really have um, a high priority. But for people like you and me, as we get older, we're going to realize from a personal perspective that the consequences are not trivial. First of all, it interrupts our ability, it cuts us off from interacting with people. 
particularly in noisy environments. So people like me who have a hearing problem are competing with a lot of back background noise just now. And of course, this has a significant knock-on effect for significant others in the strain at having to uh, communicate. The trend tends to be that as people get older, as they acquire a hearing impairment, they become uh, a bit uh, inclined to withdraw from social settings, they feel uncomfortable, and ultimately for some people, uh, uh, they're going to withdraw and there'll be isolation. That could in part, in part, explain the well-known relationship between hearing loss and cognitive uh, decline. Third point I wanted to uh, make today is that hearing loss is about to become a huge it already is, but it's going to become more of a public health issue. It, hearing impairment is about to become a, a huge disease burden. We're in a growing and ageing uh, uh, society. If you look at the statistics from the National Office of Statistics, current population UK around 60 million, and that's set over the next 20 years to rise by another 10 million. And of that additional 10 million, 6 million are going to be over the age uh, of 65. You would be forgiven for thinking then that hearing loss would be a national priority for research. But actually, if you get statistics that have been prepared, for example, by Action on Hearing Loss, the leading UK charity for deafness, you would find that this isn't the case. If you look at the research spend in the UK per person who has particular conditions, and Sarah has particular interests in cardiovascular disease and diabetes, if you look at the money that's spent in the UK per person who has cardiovascular a disease, it's around £50. If you look at the money, research money spent per person who has diabetes, it's around about £20. If you look at the spend for everyone who has a visual problem, it's about £15. And if you look at the spend per person who has hearing impairment, it looks to be £1.34. So well down in terms of priority. From the NHS perspective, the NHS buys hearing aids by the bucketful. The NHS is the largest purchaser of hearing aids in the world. In a typical year, the NHS is currently buying just a little under one million hearing aids. And because of the, the uh, volume they're buying them at, the, the cost is for the devices is something like £60 million, which is actually peanuts. It's nothing in terms of the cost spent on other health conditions and health treatments. So actually, the treatment for hearing impairment is uh, extremely cheap. The fourth point I wanted to make is that there are serious problems with uptake of adult hearing services. Right now, the uptake is both low and slow. And that's associated with poor adaptation and variable outcome uh, after treatment. In terms of being low, there's something like six million adults in the UK who uh, would most definitely benefit from wearing hearing aids. Currently, around about two million come forward for hearing aids. So only a third of individuals with a significant hearing impairment that's likely to impact on daily life, only one third are coming forward. And, it, and it's a slow uptake. Individuals who come along to get an NHS hearing aid are typically around about age 72 years. And this hearing impairment has been creeping up on them for the last 10 or, or so years. Because these individuals are coming along, sometimes with some reluctance, in their 70s, it's not unexpected that there's poor adaptation to devices and the outcome tends to be uh, extremely variable. There have been kind of blips in the past where awareness of hearing impairment has been raised and the uptake has increased. There's been national campaigns by, by leading deafness charities. And around about 10 years ago, uh, NHS audiology services were modernised and digital hearing aids were introduced. Uh, the awareness was increased, the uptake increased, but it, but it wasn't uh, sustained. The bottom line really is, you know, individuals need to recognise they have a hearing problem and have the motivation to do something about it if there are going to be uh, long-term improvements uh, in outcome. And the final point I wanted to make, the fifth point, is really related to... Uh, hearing aid, current hearing aid uh, provision. And there are some encouraging signs that have been driven at least in part by AQP. And these would be things like the increased awareness that's happening right now, uh, the uh, short referral times, 
the flexibility in appointments, uh, the use of individual um, management plans and uh, management plans. For many people, though, the, there continues to be a stigma associated with aging and hearing loss uh, and wearing hearing aids. This is quite different from seeking dental treatment or, or, or vision care, where these are seen as more of a lifestyle issue. But having to go to your GP, have to be sent on to hospitals because you're hearing impaired, you know, rings alarm bells that this means for most people, you're getting older, there's a sign of frailty, there's a disability and illness. And for many people, this is partly wrapped up in the stigma why they're uh, reluctant to, to come forward. So my final comment really is, and having just looked at statistics uh, for some publications we have coming from the UK Biobank, that the prevalence of uh, vision problems co-occurring with hearing problems seems to be particularly high. And that would suggest that there are common risk factors for vision problems and hearing problems, whatever they would be. But that would be, and I think this is probably fairly controversial, it would be to my colleagues back in, in Manchester, but I'll make the comment anyway. The co-occurrence uh, would make one think that if there was an integrated care, if these things were delivered together, that this might help overcome and r move away from the stigma associated with a disability and aging and frailty and move more towards a, a lifestyle issue. So I'll leave that thought with you right now. Thank you. No, that's very kind of you for that for introduction. So it's, it's, uh, we're waiting for Sarah then to, to come up to the lectern uh, and uh, to give a perspective from general practice. I love the way Kevin had to move the, had to stoop over the microphone and I'm going to have to move it down. Um, my name's Sarah Jarvis and I'm a GP. I feel a bit like I'm in an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. I'm, my name's Sarah Jarvis and I'm not an alcoholic, but I am a GP and that's what I do first and foremost. And whenever I appear on television, as I'll be doing this afternoon, yet again defending GPs, I see on the front page of the newspaper on all your seats Jeremy Hunt signals new out of hours role because apparently we're to blame for the out of hours crisis and the A&E attendances as well as everything else and I have to say I spend my life these days feeling as if I'm frankly a little bit under siege you really do have to be pretty brave to go out there and want to be a GP. I've wanted to be a GP since I was eight. It's all I've ever wanted to do. And when my parents were proudly dragging me out as the little girl who was going to be a doctor, and I'd be asked by their friends, and why do you want to be a doctor, Sarah? Never ever was the answer, because I want to practice cost-effective medicine. It's not what I did. I wanted to make people better. Now, when I first became a GP 22 years ago, that's what we did. We didn't keep people well, we made them better. It was all about responding to illness. Now, an enormous part of what we do relates to keeping people well because there is a real understanding that by keeping people well, we can keep them functioning and thereby reduce the cost to the NHS and to society. And in my network plan in Hammersmith and Fulham, of our five top aims, two of them are to make fuller use of community pathways so patients are seen in the most appropriate service rather than direct to acute providers, and secondly, to reduce the number of unscheduled admissions. The understanding being that that has an enormous burden, an enormous cost to the CCG and a knock-on effect to the NHS. So have we gone about doing that within my CCG? Well, for a start, one of our major tenets is that every patient over the age of 75 has what's called an integrated care plan assessment by the GP every year because we recognize that that is a cost-effective way of identifying problems which, if they were not dealt with, might result in the patient having an unscheduled hospital admission or might result in them having further downstream costs to the NHS. And that includes a mini mental state examination, a discussion of their falls, an assessment of their mobility, an assessment of their diet, of their vision, and of their hearing. And we are required, if we identify problems in any of those areas, to refer the patient to the relevant authority. Hearing is in there because it's important. Kevin knows far more about this and he said it far more succinctly than I have, that actually hearing has a huge impact, not just on your hearing, but on your social integration, on your social standing, 
almost certainly on your psychological state. A 2011 study showed that after three months using a hearing aid, all patients showed significant improvement of the psychological and cognitive conditions with which they had in this study been diagnosed before they were seen. So why is it such a problem? I absolutely get the idea of the GP as gatekeeper. Heaven knows I don't want to go to a system like they have in the USA or in France where if you want a smear or if you have a pain in your stomach, you take yourself off to see a consultant. The costs of that are enormous. GPs are very, very well placed to act as gatekeepers to the system. But what do I do if a patient comes in to see me and they say, I think my hearing is a problem? Well, firstly, I'll check their ears for wax, but that's about as far as it goes, frankly, from my perspective. At the moment, what I do, if they haven't got any wax in their ears and if they are having a problem with their hearing, I refer them to the local audiology clinic. That's best case scenario. They might be seen. They have to go to the hospital. They have to have transport. It's a time that's not convenient for their relatives to take them up. And then they'll be seen and assessed and told to come back three weeks, six weeks later to get their hearing aid fitted. Alternatively, of course, I get a patient who comes in to see me or I go and do a home visit from a patient who says, my hearing aid isn't working, so I refer them to the audiology clinic and in the meantime, they can't go out to the day centre, they can't answer the phone, they can't hear the doorbell when Meals on Wheels goes, it knocks their confidence, they are worried to go out. So it can increase social isolation. So how could direct access AQP make a difference to my practice? Well, we got it within our CCG. We only have three lots of any qualified provider services in my area of London. One of them is termination. Complete no-brainer. If a patient needs a termination, they need a termination. But the second is hearing. And actually, it's worked really, really well for my patients. The fact is, it is not going to change my management. If a patient comes to see me and says, I think I've got a problem with their hearing. I'm not going to be able to screen most of them out without referring them for a hearing test. And at present, interestingly, that involves me referring them to audiology, which is a new patient cost for the assessment. So what we've done within our practice, I've, I've downloaded some emails that we had, email discussion we had about it. I tend to use, and this is from one of my partners who's done two years in ENT, so she's our ENT expert. I use spec savers for people who are wondering about their hearing but are not sure about future steps. I tell them to book an appointment for themselves. They don't need a referral letter if they're over 55, and then come to see me with the report if they've been told it needs further action. That way, we can save the referral costs and we only need to refer to them on AQP patients who need a hearing aid. From my perspective, it's a complete no-brainer. If it was going to make a difference to our management, of course I would understand it. If it was encouraging people to access something they didn't need, of course I would understand it. But people do need it. We've heard from Kevin that there are far more people out there who need hearing aids than who actually have them. We've heard from Kevin that the vast majority of people who need a hearing aid actually come to us too late. They are 10, 15 years down the line, and I talk to patients about, with respect to hearing, just like their brains, use it or lose it. If you're not using those connections, if you're not getting out and about, you're going to lose confidence. I was reviewing the papers on Sunday morning on Radio 4, and the paper, the story that caught my eye, the first one I chose to review, was finally a victory for common sense. It was about Scotland who have decided that all this political correctness about teachers not being allowed to touch their children for fear of being sued is complete nonsense. We've got to do something about it. It's a ludicrous system where a child is sent to school for a school trip with a note from their parents saying, please apply this suntan lotion to my child, stop them getting sunburnt. The child comes home sunburnt because the teacher has been terrified to apply the suntan lotion for fear of being sued. It's nonsense. And I have to say from my perspective, of course we have to be careful about any qualified provider. Of course we have to ensure that it is qualified providers. Of course we have to ensure that we use the resources of the NHS safely. But please, let's have a victory for common sense. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah, for that uh, stimulating talk there.
So next, a perspective from Colin Campbell from Specsavers Hearing Centres. I'll move the slide on this time. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Sarah. Um, good afternoon, everybody. First, very, very quickly, um, may I thank you for attending the session. I understand that this type of event, there are great demands upon your time, so thank you for taking the time to come along um, and listen to this session on AQP and adult audiology. Uh, I don't intend to uh, give um, too much background or perspective in terms of um, Specsaver's involvement um, in the Annie Qualified Provider Initiative. We do have a, a stand here today um, and we have um, some of our, our, our experts there on the stand that can answer any local questions. What I did want to do uh, was just to pick out some of the, the key points uh, and to perhaps give a very brief overview before we take some questions as to how this initiative has, has actually landed uh, and how it lends itself perfectly to this um, t type of issue and this type of problem which is becoming more and more of a public health issue as we've, uh, as we've already heard. Four million people in the UK not accessing hearing services those that do accessing those services when their issues have become uh, so acute that adaptation to even the most sophisticated of instruments can be really really difficult i understand and certainly we understand that the aqp initiative uh, has been uh, mired in some ways in in controversy uh, and certainly debate um, and whilst i don't uh, pretend to understand all of the intricacies of the health and social care bill and the changes that are happening to you and, and your practice and to you as professionals and your patients. Um, I do believe, having practiced as an audiologist for the past 17 years, that the AQP initiative lends itself perfectly to the treatment of presbycusis. Opening up this service, raising awareness, taking away stigma is crucial to move this game on for those people who are suffering an enormous amount of social isolation because of untreated hearing loss. Your patients, around 150,000 of them referred over the past few years under the Annie Willing and an Annie Qualified Provider for Adult Hearing Services, tell us daily that being able to access this service free at the point of access, free at the point of delivery, in a place of wellness rather than illness within the community, enables them to take that decision earlier and enables them to adapt quicker and more effectively. And I'm sure that what we will all agree on today is that if we keep patient outcome at the center of these new initiatives, then we perhaps won't go too far wrong. Uh, that, that's it from me. Um, I'm really anxious that we do have some time to, to take your questions. So. so, how does that feel? So, questions from the floor on any of those perspectives if you've heard. So, microphone over there. Uh, okay, yeah, that one's fine. You there? Hello, hi, I'm Sean Gibby, GP in Rains Park in South West London. Um, I'm just wondering, so for the patients, the, for the pathway, can they just walk into any spec savers, give their postcode and say they're over 55 and then have the free test, or do they still need a referral letter from the GP uh, to do the process? Because I, I wasn't absolutely clear myself. What we decided in our practice when we looked at this was, well, does this mean that people are going to need to um, be referred, so are they on the pathway? The answer is that I've been told is that they can go in and have a screening test over the age of 55, I think, um, without any charge. If a problem is identified, then within our CCG, um, they are told to come back to the GP and to say to the GP, or, the, or if the problem is identified, they get a, a more um, detailed audiology, and the audiology um, result is sent back to the GP with a letter saying, this has been identified, we recommend that this patient should be being referred. Now, within um, Hammersmith and Fulham, one of the things, interestingly, one of the other things on the email that went round from my ENT partner was, I'd also want to know what's stopping them giving the patient a more expensive brand. And the answer I hear is that they get exactly the same tariff as they have anywhere else on the NHS, therefore they get, they, they can't, there is no hard sell of more expensive brands. Okay. 
Can I, can I add to that? Because I, I, it's, a, it's a really good question. Um, and in terms of the patient pathway, um, it's, it's interesting, and particularly as we have um, a, a lot of GPs in the room, um, there has been some debate locally um, with local contracts amongst GPs um, with some of the feedback being exactly as Sarah described, which is we'd rather there was a, a screening test so as when the patient um, represents um, at the GP that we have uh, an indication of whether they need to go on a full pathway. However, some GPs have been really reluctant to um, sort of sign that off, if you like, and they've been more inclined to say that they would prefer to make that decision themselves and that the patient, when they come to see them, will be uh, assessed, even if it's only verbally in some way, by the GP, and they would prefer... Yeah, I, Do you know, I, I have <laughs> to say, I was absolutely stunned when I heard that. Assessed how? How much training did you have in ENT? I've just about got as far as checking there's no wax. If a patient tells me that they need their hearing tested, they need their hearing tested. It's as simple as that. But I, you know, so I, I have to say, I was obviously being quite naive. I just had no idea. But what's interesting is that Specsavers has said in areas where the GPs have reflected that, then we've stopped doing the screening. Is that right? We've yeah, removed I've, the screening. Yeah. So I was absolutely amazed at how flexible they were. And when I said, this is what we're doing, and actually the only pain for us is the patient then needs to come back to us and say, you know, can they have a referral? Do they need to see us? Um, and actually you said, well, in fact, we could perhaps do a template that we would send off to you if that's what you'd like. So I have to say, you know, it, it, it seems to be all down to what you negotiate yeah. locally. T t taking away those barriers um, for the local healthcare professionals so as they are able to access the service in the way that works for you locally is something that independent service providers can talk to individual CCGs about. And I think taking away all of those barriers takes away the stigma, it, 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 it drives patient awareness, that it normalizes the condition as a, as a lifestyle sort of fact of life as we're getting older. Um, so please talk to us. I mean, in terms of individual CCGs, we're, we're here today. Uh, we have some of the contract managers here today. So we will learn from you. We will be guided by the CCGs. We will put forward innovation, but ultimately you will guide us to work within these contracts in the best way to suit your patients. Okay, I don't know about guys, you, I just but I'm to too busy keeping those 18.3 million patients out of A&E. So Sarah, thank you very much for that marvellous contribution you're making. We've just got a couple more questions that we, we need to get in before we, we release. I've got, I've got two shows of hands. Can we make it really brief, really, really focused, and, and, and experts' brief responses back, please? Um, given the co-prevalence of both the sensory disabilities, do you do a quick sight test as well? Uh, I, I didn't hear the entire question. I'm terribly sorry. Do Given how common... Uh, sorry, so, so do you do a quick... Given the comorbidities of both sensory disabilities... Ha, ha, hearing and sight, do you do a quick sight test as well? A quick sight, well, um, the, I guess the quick answer to that is no. There's no screening sight test that we offer within, um, within our, our stores and within our practices. However, what, what is part of our, um, a spec saver service, and has been for many years actually, because we've been working in audiology for many years, although some would say it's our best kept secret, is that we do offer a screening audiology test as part of the ophthalmic pre-screen. So if you're over 55 and you go into a spec savers practice, you would have your ophthalmic pre-screen accompanied by a screening test for your hearing as well. Thank you, Colin. Let's get one more in then. All right, thank you. Uh, Roger Thompson, Action on Hearing Loss, previously known as the RNID. Um, what we've been doing in Birmingham, uh, for example, is we recruited a community support officer who was previously an audiologist as well. Um, and that, or that, that CSO manages a number of volunteers to deliver the... Um, the aftercare, that, that pathway for picking up the retubing, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what the CSO in that particular instance can do is assess the person and give a detailed report of the person's hearing state because of her previous background being an audiologist. That, that, that then can be given to the patient who takes that to the GP and it kind of backs up to say to the GP, listen, this person needs to go to ENT or they need to go directly to audiology. And it just kind of it, 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 it um, prevents all that person going to be referred to the wrong department and, and things getting messed around that way as well. But um, Action on Hearing Loss have been running the, uh, uh, what we call our Here to Helps around the country for a, a couple of years now and where we've been trying to engage with um, NHS audiologists to try and 
um, support the uh, voluntary work using volunteers to deliver um, the, the, the hearing aid and uh, re batteries retubing pathway in hopefully um, shortening. Okay, all, thank you. Um, uh, do you mind we just kind of... Sorry, yeah, just, just taking a bit of pressure off... Um, off those audiologists okay. in the hospital. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Well, we're nearly, we're nearly there. I just wondered if uh, any of our panel want to make some last comments before you leave. Any recommendations to those commissioners out there in that back row about what they should be doing different? Should, any, any, any thoughts that you might want to... Kevin, do you want to say anything to our commissioning colleagues about what they, what they might want to think about in terms of commissioning uh, hearing loss services? Well, I'm happy to stay around and chat afterwards. I'll okay. No so there's an offer to right chat now. later if you wish. Anything from Sarah or Colin? No, I think I've said it all, really. Let's have some common sense. It's not going to change my management having okay. this. Okay, so quick show of hands. Are you going to do anything differently about hearing loss before you, before you leave here? Any, anything differently? Very good. You made an impact already. Well done, everybody. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you to Specsavers as well.